Hey guys, in the previous episode, we saw cave paintings which showed how the Nagas looked, but this evidence is simply not enough. Mainstream archaeologists and historians will claim these birdmen were not Nagas, but were mere human beings wearing masks. So I began searching for more evidence near the village of Kirvali, which is said to be the home of Valiers or Nagas. I want to find something much more tangible, something which is not a cave painting, something which will prove to us how the Nagas really looked. So, I'm exploring the woods nearby. This is a very remote location and there is nobody around. This area is controlled by the government's forest department. I have no idea if I will find something or if this is going to be a dead end. The sun is setting fast and wild animals may start coming out after dusk. Suddenly, I see a very different area which strangely reminds me of Kular Caves. Remember how Kular Caves was a flat, rocky area in the middle of nowhere? I see something very similar here, a flat plain with a rock bed underneath. This is a very large area and looking around, it is strewn with gigantic rocks. But I don't see anything specific. It appears to be just another prehistoric site with large rocks. But something pulls me in a specific direction. It appears as though there is nothing. Maybe my instinct failed me. It is just bushes and trees. But behind them, I finally see this amazing statue. What is this? And why is it found in the middle of nowhere? It looks different than anything else I have ever seen. This is extraordinary. It is made of a white rock and immediately after laying your eyes on this, you will think of a bird or a birdman. Look at the wings, the tail fin, and how it is standing upright as though it is rising to fly in the air. Remember how I showed you the Nagas, the winged creatures in cave paintings? Look at the similarity between the cave painting and the statue. It is not similar. It is almost identical. This cannot be a coincidence. This is definitely not a natural rock. It has been clearly carved. In fact, it has been perfectly chiseled to make it flat. It is even polished. Look. We are in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the woods, and here I see this weird stone statue. Why do I always find these crazy artifacts in the middle of nowhere? I can see modern graffiti of vandals. They've scribbled all over the statue. These guys are destroying prehistory. I take measurements. It is about... 8.8 .8 feet tall, and I'm sure some of it is underneath the ground. There is no way a rock can stand in this angle, almost perpendicular to the ground, unless some of it is buried in the ground. So the total height must be more than 10 feet. It is three and a half feet wide at the shortest width and eight feet wide at the base. Suddenly, I realize that I found something extraordinary. This is a very, very unique statue. I have found the link between prehistory and history. 
In prehistory, human beings were living like cavemen, and they did not create any religious structures like statues. Why? Because they did not have any actual religion. They did not worship gods in the form of statues. In historic period, in India, they created plenty of religious statues and carvings. I've shown you thousands of amazing statues which belong to the historic period. However, what do we see here? A prehistoric religious statue. This must be the forerunner of all religious statues in India. We are literally staring in the face of the origin of religion. This statue is the link between prehistory and history. And this statue definitely does not depict a human. It does not depict a man with a mask. If this were a cave painting, archaeologists will explain that it is in fact a human being with a mask. However, they cannot say that about statues. Let's compare a figure of a Naga now from the historic period. It has wings and looks humanoid. Archaeologists and historians do not claim that this is a human being with a mask. They agree that this is a god. Perhaps this statue was the very first carving of Naga, and ancient Indian texts are very clear. Nagas were reptilian figures who came from a different realm. They had a snake-like face and also had wings which enabled them to fly. Is it possible that such beings really arrived on our planet thousands of years ago? As humans, we are inherently not capable of exploring possibilities. We are the same species which believed that flying machines were impossible to build just a hundred years ago. Even if some mainstream experts agree that there is a possibility of aliens, the aliens should be bipedal, walking on two legs, and bifocal, having two eyes, and should be about the same size as human beings. Otherwise, people cannot even imagine the concept of aliens. Why can't they be giants, dwarfs, or winged creatures? See, human beings have a very limited imagination. Last month, I had an American friend who visited me in India and was surprised. India does not have Walmarts. Think about it. What are the odds that aliens would walk on two legs just like human beings? So open your mind and ask yourself, is it possible that Nagas with wings arrived on planet Earth? This is not only a possibility. In fact, this is a sign of advanced genetic technology. This is our future as well. Today, our scientists are working to give us wings. But where is the head of this figure? We can see it in the cave paintings, but it seems like it has been chopped off from the statue. Who destroyed it and why? Perhaps the head still lies here on the ground somewhere. While I'm searching for the lost head, suddenly a mysterious figure walks in. This elderly person tells me he herds cattle in the forest. In his late 70s, he still shepherds more than 30 goats and is surprised to see me in this area. I will refer to him as my grandpa. 
Grandpa explains that this rock is known as visiripare, which means fan rock in English. I'm immediately reminded of the fan blades, the propellers I saw in the cave paintings. But I'm not able to see any connection between the two. I ask him about the statue. Then I visit Paran Radondu, Sami on our Deva Toda. I read the Atlima Atliaman Angaway Pata Tanjurma, and now she have dinner. I'm a cold he tells me that the temple, known as Athiliaman Temple, is the oldest temple in the world. This is getting me very excited. We have already just seen a prehistoric statue possibly the oldest religious statue in the world. Now he tells me he will lead me to the oldest temple in the world. What kind of a temple would this be? What kind of materials and technology would have been used to build the oldest temple in the world? I'm excited, but Grandpa urges me to walk faster and tells me that the sun is setting fast. If we don't reach the temple sooner, we could get lost in the woods. The temple must be getting a few visitors because at least there is a path that's been laid out. On the way, various clothing items are strewn around. There must be a strange story behind this which I have no idea about. Grandpa is a lot faster than me, and he's leading the way. And finally, we reach the temple. It is fascinating because it does not look like other Hindu temples, which were built much later in time. I had imagined that there would be a tower-like structure but there is nothing of that sort. It is just surrounded by tridents and bells. But let's go and find out what's in the main chamber. Well, it is not what's in the main chamber that amazes me. It is the chamber itself. It is a dolmen, a prehistoric stone hut. This is exactly what we saw in Kuller Caves. This is a Darwin without any doubt. It is made of three stone slabs on the sides and one slab on top. I verified that this is the original structure. This has not been recently created, but this is in fact an ancient dolmen. Inside the dolmen, a small statue, about one foot tall, is placed. Now they call it Adliyaman, but the original name of this figure is Adi Aman, meaning the very first mother. What does the term very first mother mean? According to locals, all the human ancestors before her were primitive human beings who lived in caves. And she was the very first wife of the Naga king and gave birth to the first sophisticated human being. This is why she is known as the mother goddess who was able to give birth to the modern human species. In fact, many cultures around the world have a female figure as their mother goddess who's believed to have given birth to modern human beings. I'm trying to decode the meaning of the story in a very detached way. 
Grandpa, however, is totally grateful to Ateliaman for creating the human race. Without her, his family, his ancestors, and the entire society would not exist. He truly believes that this is where the gods intermingled with primitive cavemen to create the modern human species. In fact, the depiction of Nagas taking human wives is carved in many, many Hindu temples. It is clearly shown that Nagas intermarried with human beings. Are these depictions a mere fantasy or are they based on some truth? We need to think deeply about the site. What happened here thousands of years ago? It is a very unconventional temple. There are clay figurines of horses. There are tridents planted everywhere. Hundreds of bells are placed around. Grandpa tells me that ringing these bells will invoke the gods. When I ring the bells, the sound echoes through the woods. Lots of monkeys roam around me, hoping that I would have brought some food as offerings for the mother goddess. But I have nothing, and the monkeys are disappointed. Did human beings evolve from apes? While scientists categorically claim that modern human beings are products of pure evolution, which is a very slow process, history shows something really, really strange. Let us take a careful look at the human past. How do historians classify the human past into history and prehistory? All scientists agree that human beings began walking upright nearly 200,000 years ago. Yet, they remained primitive, did not know how to read or write, and did not create anything substantial until a few thousand years ago. This period, this dark period, is pretty much like trying to trace the history of chimpanzees. Chimps don't create anything. They just live and die. Human beings were like animals for nearly 98% of the 200,000 years. This time period, where there's no trace of their achievements, is called the prehistoric period. And then, as though they suddenly woke up from sleep, they went from living in caves to reaching Mars. This period where we can actually trace the achievements in human development is called the historic period. This is what you read in history books. Now, what happened that was so significant that primitive cavemen transformed into modern human beings who could build great temples and great societies? I am literally standing on one of those magical sites where the transformation happened. This little temple in the middle of the woods is the place where we find history and prehistory collide. Think for a minute, is this temple a prehistoric site or a historic site? It has all the features of a historic site. It has statues, bells, and tridents. But at the center, it has a prehistoric structure a dolmen. This is quite exciting to see. We have actually found the link 
between prehistory and history. This is monumental because such a site is very hard to find. And what happened here? We are literally looking at how cavemen were transformed into modern human beings. And this transformation was due to the intermingling of Nagas and primitive human beings. Mainstream historians and archaeologists believe that the gods of India are fictional characters and not based on truth. They argue that while Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad are historical figures who existed as a matter of fact, Hindu gods like Nagas are products of sheer imagination. But is it possible that Hindu gods really came down from the sky? While other religions like Christianity and Islam were created during the historic period, Hinduism goes way back in time and touches the prehistoric period. This is why historians and archaeologists are not able to trace how this ancient religion began. Perhaps we could understand this better if we look at what we have found so far. In the first episode, we found small stone huts which were built by Nagas themselves. Local tribes still worship the Nagas as gods. However, we did not know how they looked. In the second episode, we found the bloodstone which led us to cave paintings which showed how the Nagas looked. They had bird-like wings and used advanced technology like propellers. In this episode, we found a statue of a Naga, which is similar to the cave painting depictions. Finally, we also saw that the stone hut is used as a temple and how the mother goddess gave birth to the modern human being. But what else did the Nagas do on Earth? How else did they change human beings? To find more about this, I need to study and explore the connections between history and prehistory. Grandpa gives me no clues for the next place to explore. I don't know what I'm going to do but I need to go in search of the forbidden past.